Hello, my name is Adam Pease. I'm the owner of Articulate Software, and uh, I want to talk today about language sense and the conceptual inventory. This is an informal talk, um, basically going to try to cover some concepts that aren't really suitable for an academic publication, aren't really terribly technical, um, but do have a big impact on framing the work in ontology, taxonomy, controlled vocabulary, and, and similar areas uh, of, uh, of discipline in computer science and linguistics. And this is a uh, presentation, a topic that was prompted by uh, a question from a customer that I had uh, who was uh, asking us to create a taxonomy and had a very natural question about, well, how do we know when we're done? What does it mean to actually cover this domain that we care about? And this in turn prompted some discussion of you know, what do we mean in fact by a domain and what is coverage and uh, what are concepts? So as some additional background, uh, I want to explain the notion between uh, languages and concepts. Uh, so different languages, obviously, can have different labels for the same concept. And you know this if you're bilingual, or even uh, if you uh, work in multiple communities, uh, you might have different labels that are appropriate for that community, uh, but actually refer to the same thing. Uh, and so once recently I was in an airport, I was uh, overhearing a conversation between an older Korean mother and her adult daughter. Uh, and the older mother was speaking uh, Korean, the daughter was speaking in English. They were clearly speaking about the same topic, about the same things, but they had different labels for them. They understood each other perfectly. Um, the labels were different, uh, different labels for the same things. It's also a common thing to bring up uh, for people uh, that have maybe read some popular linguistics works, uh, but this notion of the 15 Eskimo words for snow is an example of how uh, languages, in fact, can influence thought, uh, and that people that uh, speak a given language might, by virtue of their knowledge of the words in that language, have the ability to say things in their own language that they might not be able to say in another language. Um, this in academia, has, uh, linguistics, formal linguistics, has I think been uh, uh, disproven, at least to an extent. Um, this notion of the 15 Eskimo words for snow, it's clear to any uh, skier that speaks English that there are many different words for snow, powder, corn snow, ice, uh, and so forth. Uh, now, it may be the case that words don't have a direct one-to-one -one correspondence, right? There might be uh, a word for a particular kind of snow in uh, an Inuit language, a, a native northern language, uh, that is a single word, um, whereas to translate it into English might require multiple words. Um, but of course, this is very common. Um, you, we have multiple words, phrases in English that refer to a specific, con uh, specific concept or topic like heart rate or something as complex as intergovernmental communication. You could imagine uh, inventing a single word to cover these phrases, uh, but it's not necessary. Uh, we can refer to concepts with multiple words and that's okay. And just because uh, from one, one language might have a single word for something and another language might require maybe even a very long phrase or explanation, that doesn't mean it's untranslatable. It's just maybe more cumbersome or, or less familiar. And you see this even within languages. You get very specialized terms, say, in sailing or woodworking or, or any other topic um, that you could still explain to somebody that doesn't know that word that speaks English, uh, but it would be less efficient, it would be less elegant. That doesn't mean think these things are untranslatable, just that you know, in some languages maybe it's easy, in some languages it's more challenging. Um, another topic that we should bring up is this notion of uh, pragmatics, um, which is essentially the knowledge behind a text. And uh, linguists will, will awful, often divide uh, the, the topic of linguistics into three broad areas, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. So syntax includes things like, in English, uh, we make verbs a past tense typically by adding an ed on the end. I walked. Um, it's the mechanics of the language. Uh, semantics is more of uh, what do things mean? 
um, and it has a tight relationship to syntax, so that addition of the ED, that formal grammatical rule for the morphology or how we alter this, the word structure uh, to make something a past tense, that's the syntax, but the fact of it referring to the past tense of something we did or something somebody else did, uh, that's semantics, that's meaning. Um, so I walked. That means there was a walking that was in the past tense, and I, I am the subject in the sentence I walked, um, and the meaning is that I, the speaker, did something walking in the past tense. Now, pragmatics uh, is all the stuff that's behind the text. So as an example, uh, you might imagine somebody uh, shouting, don't drop that plate. Um, and the pragmatics behind it and why that was shouted maybe with some urgency is because the plate will fall and break. Now, that may not be explained anywhere in the text, and there's lots of things like this that, that people don't talk about explicitly uh, when they're writing on a particular topic that are just uh, assumed to be true. There's knowledge about the world that every, every speaker of that language in that particular audience should have. That's part of the pragmatics. Uh, as a ex practical example for this, I had a customer that was doing some uh, customer service applications, and so I was trying to build some ontology for him. Um, and he asked quite naturally, isn't there some automatic way we can get uh, all of these terms or concepts out of the text automatically? Uh, and this is a very con common thing, especially today with machine learning applications. And so I brought up the notion of user error. Um, there were no transcripts with, from customers or customer service people that would refer to this, this notion. Um, every customer service person would know that, uh, okay, this user is having trouble because they simply didn't follow the instructions. Uh, it was an error on their part, and they think it was something the system was doing wrong, but they just didn't you know, follow the, the normal procedure. They didn't understand how the system worked. Now, maybe that meant the system could be better designed, but in some sense, it's, it's user error. The user using something not as intended or not paying attention to something that the system was telling him or her very explicitly. But you'll never see the topic, uh, the, the phrase user error in any of those transcripts. It would be kind of insulting to the user just to tell them, oh, you, you messed up, it's, it's not our fault. Right? You don't want to say that to your users. Um, but that concept was behind a, a lot of these transcripts where the, the customer service person was sort of patiently explaining something and how to do it in a way that would get the user the result that they wanted. Um, and there's lots of stuff like this that's never explicitly uh, mentioned in the text and therefore can't really directly be mined or recognized by an automated system. But a human ontologist or taxonomist can indeed find this sort of thing and represent it, define it formally. So back to the original question, you know, what does it mean to cover a particular domain? Uh, well, we might turn that question around and ask uh, for a programmer, what does it mean to have a program that's done? Well, you have a certain set of requirements for performance. Uh, does testing show that you can perform all the functions that the customer has requested? Um, and so that is one metric that could also be used for determining whether you've covered a domain. Another would be that you've covered all the concepts that do actually appear in the text and defined them in some way and related them to another. That would be another method of coverage. But before you even get started on talking about coverage, the key thing is to understand the difference between language, the labels, and concepts, these sort of intangible things uh, that are really behind the text and maybe referred to in different ways or referred to only very obliquely or assumed as background knowledge. So that's it for this talk. I hope you found it informative, uh, and if you did, uh, please uh, like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks very much.